Hello once again, viewers, to the Emerging Cricket Live show again this Thursday. Thank you for joining us once more. I'm Daniel Beswick. Uh, we've got another special guest coming up in a couple of moments. But before we do chat to Vanuatu Cricket Association CEO Shane Dietz, I uh, want to thank every single one of you for liking and sharing the Facebook page as well as the Twitter page as well. We've had something like seven or 8,000 likes on Facebook in the last 10 days alone. So a huge, huge influx of people interested in emerging cricket. And I'm sure Shane will talk to us about the uh, influx of attention on Vanuatu cricket in recent weeks. We've also got a podcast dropping tomorrow as well where we talk to German cricket CEO Brian Mantle. We're all looking forward to showing you guys that. But once again, thank you as I do bring in our guest from Fort Villa. And uh, we've had to deal with a couple of sound issues and some sounds uh, and ambience around in Port Villa. But it's our pleasure to welcome Cricket Vanuatu Association CEO Shane Dietz to the show. How are you, Daniel? Yeah, good, mate. Thank you. Yes, yeah, uh, police college got some church songs going in the background. It's quite nice to hear, but maybe not for the pod, for the, the show. But anyway, it's it's a good atmosphere here. No, that's good. Yeah, plenty of, plenty of ambience. We've seen some great atmosphere as well in the Vanuatu T10 Blast. We're coming up to the penultimate weekend of the competition, uh, a tri-series where everyone plays each other three times before the final, which will be held not this Saturday, but the Saturday after. Um, the attention has been on Vanuatu in the last few weeks because, well, all over the world we've seen, uh, I suppose, coronavirus COVID take over the world but you guys have been relatively lucky to be essentially COVID free it's given you guys the opportunity to, to showcase cricket but also a chance to to showcase Vanuatu to the world as well yeah unbelievable we've uh, dodged the you know COVID-19 which yeah we feel sorry for the rest of the world and we feel for everyone out there um yeah we the, the government here did a good job and locked the borders down in time and yeah, we escaped us. It's unbelievable that we had that opportunity to now bring cricket to the rest of the world. And I think it's yeah, it's our duty to do that while everyone was locked down around the world. If we can offer a bit of live cricket, a bit of live sport for everyone, we thought we had to do it. And say so the um the heat's been on us, everyone's watching us, so there's a lot of pressure and a lot of work had to go into it. But yeah, it's been a fantastic journey for us as an organisation and for the players to get this exposure. And we hope the cricket's been good. I think it's been really, really good. Um, yeah, and we've uh, tried to live up to those expectations and I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Yeah, well, it's taken over our Saturdays here. Um, we've been watching yeah, right. just about all the action, two T10 games a day. It's been thick and fast, you know, matches going for about 90 minutes, a lot of them going down to the final over, if not the last ball. I think... I think the skills on show, both, both with bat and ball, but also on the field have been quite telling, very athletic in the field as well. Um, a lot of people probably saw Vanuatu cricket for the first time a few weeks prior to that. You guys had your women's T20 finals day. You also had a men's exhibition match as well. And you guys would have seen the incredible numbers that that pulled. Did that change your preparation? Because we know there was a 40-over competition that you guys were planning on doing. You've gone to a T10 format. What was the thinking behind that? Yeah, well, it went so well, as you said. Half a million views on our, our Facebook was just phenomenal. So it's an opportunity. It's probably once in a lifetime that Venezuela can take the spotlight of the world. And T10 is probably the best um, entertainment package you could probably offer. Two games a day gives the, the people to see all the players that we got. If you went to four teams, it might have been the standard might have dropped a little bit, but three teams involving the club, so that gives them identity in the whole process, which was important for us. So, yeah, we postponed the 40 over comp, bring some live T10 action, exciting. I haven't seen much T10, to be honest, but I'm a massive fan of it now. And um, yeah, it's, it's been uh, phenomenal to, to watch it. The game changes so fast and the, the action's non-stop, so... I've really enjoyed it. I'm sorry about the commentary. It's probably been terrible. It's a long time to talk for four hours. It's a, it is. <laughs> it is. To, to ramble on, but uh, we managed to do it. And, yeah, so that was the thing. Give it once in a lifetime opportunity. Let's put it out there, Ben, I'm out of cricket and try to get some exposure. Open the door for people to see the cricket we've got here, our facilities. Yeah, we really want to open up cricket tourism and many teams from Australia and New Zealand come and challenge 
our players to a, to a game, and that's what we want to do. We challenge any club team out there to take on the mighty Vanuatu men's and women's. I don't think you stand a chance, especially in T10, T20. So the challenge is out there. If anyone wants to take it, get in touch. We'll take you on. Yeah, you guys have a little bit more practice in the T10 format now, and, and given you guys are the only people playing cricket at the moment, uh, competitively almost bar a couple of yes. leagues in, in Europe, you guys have, uh, are well and truly ready to go. Now, a lot of people would probably remember you, especially in Australian circles, as, as playing, you know, for over mm. a decade for, for South Australia, but you came to Vanuatu in 2014. What's the change you have seen in, in the last six years? You, you've taken on several roles in that capacity, both playing, coaching, and now uh, in administration. What What are the changes you've seen in that last six years? Yeah, we, you know, the guys before I got here did a really good groundwork with school visits. So the grassroots was set up pretty good. Um, it was just probably the top end, uh, the high performance that needed a bit of polishing, a bit more exposure and, and some new ideas perhaps. So that was – the foundations were there something really good to develop and I think that it has developed. We've had a big investment in the facilities um, when I first arrived, the VCG was pretty average, to say the least. There was no nets down there, no nothing. So developed some really good training facilities and now developed that field even further. And we seem to always have an opportunity to either get promotion or relegation in World Cricket League. So we're always playing every year, which really helped because you had competition regularly. So that really helped us. There was a young team when I arrived too, so all those guys are now, I think the average age would be mid-20s, and that's about a good time for them to develop. So it's been a development of a good young team, and I think the changes has come in as most all the guys are full-time contractor now, so there's a bit more professionalism. Lots of things have gone in the right direction. We've probably had a fair bit of luck as well along the way. Lots of clubs in Australia have helped our players out and let them play. The women's game's really developed a lot. That's probably our biggest change. We hardly had much women's cricket, and that's really developed. So it's been so many positives. It's always challenges like any associate country. Um, and, yeah, we're just – in the associates, you just sort of got to take on the challenges and work out best you can what you can do. So, yeah, lots of lots of those challenges. But I think we, everything was set up really well. The work Mark Stafford and Pierre Chilia did, getting all the grassroots set up over a long period of time, has really put us in good stead to launch a high-performance program, which we've done over that period of time since we've been here, and we've got to really take it to the next level now. Yeah, well, given the fierceness of associate cricket, World Cricket League cricket, and now the, the Challenge League, you do need a little bit of luck on the way. But uh, I suppose with you guys getting as much prep in at the moment with a three-team competition, you can almost make your own luck um, or being you know being lucky by, by having that practice. So to look to the blast now... And the mighty, the mighty Afate Panthers have, have taken uh, a lead in that three-team competition. A few Sharks in second. Uh, you've got the MT Bulls, who I drew out in our sort of emerging cricket podcast draw. Yeah. I thought they might be a, a smoky for for the for the for taking out the entire tournament. Unfortunately, it hasn't quite materialised. Um, what have you seen? Who are the players who have um, have stood up in this in this competition? Because I'm sure it's a little bit different, you know, going from from just the national team players to now having three teams, 36 to 40 players to look at uh, every game. Uh, have you been surprised by a couple of guys who have stood up or has it been some of the usual suspects? It's been a little bit of the usual usual suspects. You know, those guys are full-time contractors. So they get to train a lot more and it's been tough for the guys that only play club cricket once a week to sort of step up to that level. But I think that game that the MT Bulls won, uh, and a couple of those young guys have got them over the line. That was a fantastic performance to see see those young fellas step in. And we've got a few other young fellas into the squad and they're starting to find their feet and show that, you know, Clement Tommy made a real good 50 man in the match one game. He's one of one for the future and really needs to step up, um, probably have some self-belief. And I think having a man in the match performance gave him that. But I think uh, Nala Nipiko, Josh Razu um, and Andrew Mansali have all done well. Tony Tomato did, got some wickets. He's a good young prospect as well as a fast bowler. So that's the best he's developed and he's got real confidence now as well. So I think he's been in that pressure cooker environment, which associate cricket is the biggest pressure cooker I've ever witnessed in any cricket. You know, your whole program, all your funding's riding on like five games at, at, uh, World, at um, Challenge Leagues and, and um, World Cricket League previously. 
So having that practice under that pressure, that's what we really need, and that will help us a lot. And say it's there's still a few more games left. I reckon the MT Bulls are a huge show. We're still pulling a win off here. So don't write them off yet, Daniel. Yeah, I need I need Patrick Matautava to come through and, and get a good score. Yes, good score. Yes. He was a bit unlucky over the weekend. He probably copped a ways tie, uh, full toss, no ball, which wasn't called. Um, but to bring yes. it back to, to, to the VCG and the VCG surface, it's a very unique surface. It's a hybrid wicket. Um, a lot of people potentially watching the streams for, from all over the world probably aren't you know certain of how that pitch is actually made up and, and what has gone what effort has gone into yeah. to, to make that wicket. Um, it is a hybrid surface. Do you want to explain to, to everyone around how that surface is made and, and what the, the composition is? Yeah, so it's made by Gabba Sports in Brisbane. Um, I first saw it in Dubai at the ICC Academy. And then uh, Cricket Australia have got one at the Central Ex- Excellence, where they had one. And New South Wales Cricket got a few. So basically it's, it was on one of our old synthetic pitches. We ripped up the old synthetic and you just laid a new synthetic on there, which is obviously designed with l- sort of longer blades of grass or longer blades of plastic grass. Then you basically just dump the soil on top of it, brush the grass through, and then wet it and roll it, and you've got a cricket pitch. And it's it's a huge game changer for us because um, we're going to synthetic to like pitches in Malaysia, for example. It's so different, and it always takes us such a long time to get climatized. So. For us to get regular play on this, particularly facing spinners and playing spin is a key. Spinners usually win a lot of tournaments, I think, at associate level, so that's a big advantage for us. Um, the soil we got is a bull-eye soil, which is the same they use at the SCG, so that was the biggest, toughest part, getting that sent over. So we got once we got that over, yeah, as I say, it's, it's a pretty simple process and easy to maintain. So basically after each game, Put a bit of soil on the footholes and where the batsman's been standing, light bit of water and roll it, and you're ready to go again. So it's it's phenomenal. You know, we've still got some teething problems to how to get it perfect, um, but we're working through that. And with Gabba's support, we're developing further. I'm sure we're going to get a couple more over here in the next few years. Um, hopefully at the soccer stadium under lights, we can play some night cricket, and that will be like a drop-in pitch sort of scenario there. Yeah, but with the cost, of the price, it's a game changer. We have no chance of getting a turf wicket here. So, and it plays relatively the same and no maintenance. So, really, we're really lucky. Great. And I recommend all the associates to really consider it. I know a few are. And I reckon it's a big opportunity for developed cricket for associate countries. Yeah, it looks, it seems to be a pretty big financial outlay to, to go to a fully turf setup. So a lot of countries have had to go to the AstroTurf setup. But if you're yes. able to, to create that that mix, and hopefully people are, you know, out there are watching this and seeing the results, it looks a little bit tacky in, in that morning, that early period. But if you give it a couple of overs, just like any surface with, with a newer ball, uh, it seems that everyone has adapted to it yeah. pretty well. Yeah, and I think in the previous we had the covers off. You know, it was one o'clock start. I think in the first week it was okay in the first game. By the second game it was a bit dry, and the team was sharks and bowl out for thirty, and probably didn't perform best. So we kept basically the covers on to just uh, just before the start of play, and then when Andrew went starting the ball, it jumped a bit. It was a little bit tacky. So on the weekend we took the covers off half an hour before play, and that was probably the right mix. Got a little bit of sun, so that tackiness just wore off. So it dries out really fast and it was a really hot day on the weekend. So that's just getting the right combination, how to get it exactly right for us. That worked out well. I think on the weekend it was played really well all day. So we'll probably stick to that principle again for, for the next two weekends. But say it's quite new, so we're still trying to work out the best way of making it work for us. But so far I think it's performed really, really well. To take it more broadly to, to the entirety of Vanuatu and the participation numbers, we've seen, you know, you guys compete um, an under-19 World Cup qualification as well. A lot of those players actually playing in the blast as well. Um, I, I know the geography of Vanuatu is quite tricky to actually bring everyone together. There, You know, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of islands around the country. What are your junior participation numbers like and, and what do you guys do to, to get out into local communities to promote the game? Yeah, so the players, the men's players are, say, full-time contracted and 20 hours of that is development work, going to the schools, running school competitions. So we go to over 100 schools across 
a few islands. Uh, Santo is the second biggest, well, the biggest island, but the second biggest population. We go there. Uh, Malakula, which is right next to Santo, is another big island, and Tana, which is like the third biggest. So we're targeting those areas to develop those areas. Obviously, the schools within Port Villa, we've nailed them and we visit them regularly. Uh, the numbers are the numbers are good. We're participation we're over twenty thousand uh, across the country. Um, developing those numbers into some competitive cricket is what we're trying to do now. We're trying to get some softball, softball competitions, etc. So that's the challenge. And then, and then having some club and school hardball cricket. And it's always a challenge because the equipment is just, you know, you can't just go to sports or you buy some cricket gear. you got to get it all sent over. It's all hand-me-downs. And, yeah, that, that's the biggest challenge. So you might do. I remember my first time I was here, I had an under nine trial game. We were about to go select a team to go to the World Cup qualifier. I think in the 20 odd guys we had, we had four pairs of shoes. So the bowler was running in and bowling it over and taking his shoes off, no socks, handing them to the next kid, and he'd use the same pair of shoes. So they're the challenges that we've got. Um, but that, that, that's the, probably the hardest part is trying to get the equipment and get everyone organized together and get a bus and bring them all to the ground. So they're the challenges and trying to develop that junior cricket into that more structured system is something we're probably going to work on a little bit more over the next few years. Yeah, it's a tricky, it's a tricky one, I'm sure. Um, I'm trying to get that balance right. And speaking of actually bringing things into the country, uh, knowing that Bet Barter was your sponsor for this T10 tournament coming up and you've got, you know, Ad, uh, ad boards and advertising on the ground. Um, how difficult was it to, to get all that stuff sent into you? Because I'm sure international travel and international postage, international shipping has been really difficult. So how have you guys gone about setting everything up while being pretty much, you know, on your own in, in your own little space? Yeah, well, we're lucky. There's a few good printers here. Classic printers, they did all that printing for us in a really short period of time, I guess, <laughs> they haven't got much business on at the moment because no one else is getting anything done. But they printed everything in the space of a week. So that was really lucky. It's probably the mats that you see behind the bowlers run up there. We just found that was the hardest thing to try to get that because that was on the list of things that they wanted us to get done. But we found some old um, pitch mats and turned them upside down, patched up a few holes, got a local like graffiti artist to hand paint it on and it looks really good. So it's just finding a way. But most of the stuff we yeah, we could get here, we are a little bit limited to what they really wanted to get done around the grounds and basically put up scaffolding and just put it on front of the scaffolding and you just work around and find something that works. So, so far, I think it worked well. The grounds look fantastic and you know, the sponsors are happy with that that regard. And then from that, at the ground, you guys have had the hospitality set up. You, you know, you've got the yourself and Damo and commentary. The Tusker, I'm sure, is flowing. Um, what's the reaction been actually in Port Vila and the surrounds to the to the competition being on for for people to go in person? Has it been popular? There looks to be a, a few, you know, members of the crowd around keen to watch some action as well. Yeah, it's growing. All the, it's growing every week. So and everyone's talking about it. Um, you know, my wife always gets. Uh, what time's the cricket starting this weekend? The kids want to go, so we got a jumpy castle in as well last week. The bean bags, most of, on the, you know, the holiday in hospitality, technically calling it. Yeah, it's, the bean bags are out there. The Tusker is flowing, I assure you. Um, but there yeah, also a lot of Nivanawatu getting down there. Kids are running a mark. It's just been a great atmosphere. Music's been played by um, Pacific uh, radio stations, so it's been it's been a really good atmosphere. We've got two weekends to go. I think the finals day we'll do something special, try to get some of the dignitaries from town and parliament and the Australian High Commission down there, so that could be really good. But, yeah, everyone's taking it on board here. That's what we really need is really kickstart a bit of club cricket, get a bit of a vibe around club cricket again, and that's really done the trick. Yeah, the tribalism that that probably creates, having, you know, the, the three teams battling it out against each other. I'm sure there are a lot of people watching who are interested in 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 fantasy and using Bet Barter as, you know, a, a, as a client. Um, do you want to give out any predictions for the last two weeks of action? Because I'm sure people are very keen to see how, how the rest of it plays out. Can my MT yeah. balls get there? 
Mate, a, a massive chance. Anything's possible. Um, yeah, you want to play your best cricket in the final, not beforehand, so maybe they'll just save themselves. They're going to peak, but they've got to win the last two games effectively. Um, and then, you know, the mighty Afate Panthers, they might just take the foot off the gas a bit because they're probably guaranteed a final now. Uh, but we could have all, te- all three teams on three wins by the end of this. It's, it's amazing that it's gone so close. So, yeah, I think anything's possible. Don't write them off. If you get to the final, the big match players are in the Bulls team. So I'd be – I'm not putting my money on because I'm not allowed to put my money on anyway. <laughs> and everyone keeps asking me, what's the lineup, sir? What's the lineup, oh, sir? Yeah. On, on Twitter and Facebook, I would say I've got – about 3,000 new friend requests a day. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's great that, that people around the subcontinent, Asia, are following Venholatsu cricket. They've probably never heard of the country before. So phenomenal, phenomenal that's all happening for us. Yeah, again, a great advertisement for, for you guys and, and Vanuatu in general. So to quickly take it to, to the international game and you guys competing in the Challenge League, which is – one of the pathways towards the 2023 mm. World Cup. You guys competed in one of those Challenge League series before, uh, I suppose, before COVID hit and all of that was was put on the back burner. Uh, one just one, just the one game, but it was an amazing game where you guys defended 65 in, I believe it's actually yeah. a world record for the, the lowest total defended in a, a list day match. So first yes. of all, congratulations. How did you guys sort of assess that? That um, that challenge league leg, it looked as if it, w- it was pretty tough playing against some some strong opposition. But I'm sure it's a good uh, yeah. experience for your boys as well. Yeah, like Malaysia is a horrible place for, for me to want to try to play cricket again. It's a million degrees and a thousand percent humidity. It was terrible. Um, but yeah, that was a, it's a really good league. I like the system they got now. And so you're guaranteed for three years of cricket. It's a good competition. We get to play against Canada, which is the highest sort of team you play before. And like all those tournaments, if you get a bit of momentum early, you can really steamroll the opposition. And, you know, the first game, we actually should have beat Canada. We we dropped five catches in 14 balls, and we would have had them around, from memory, about six for 50, chasing 180, 170. So we missed an opportunity there and then probably took the wind out of our sails. And then we had that game against Malaysia where the ball was swinging because we were using Duke's balls for the first time. And it wasn't easy to bat, particularly at the horse race uh, field. The, well, the wicket was, I would say, not as good as it could be. I'll be politically correct. It was a pretty average pitch. Um, but, yeah, and, but what we, we caught, it was just those days where they never played a miss. They nicked everything. The guys... Josh Razu was that second slip. He could have won man of the match for his catches alone. He didn't drop a thing. Um, even though he dropped three against Canada, though. So don't worry about it. I'll keep reminding him. Um, but, yeah, we just – the ball swung. Pat had it on a string. He got five wickets. They just kept nicking. We kept catching them. And every time the ball in the air went to hand, you got those days they nick him in the gaps or chip him over the field. Everything just went our way. And when we played good cricket that day, and uh, particularly in the field – and I think they probably thought they won the game too, but the boys were really pumped up for that. Oh, really fired up. Pat was steaming and he was bowling easy mid-130s. That was the quickest to sit in bowl for a while. And so just things went our way and it was amazing. That was a world record. And I know the scores looked like the standards of play wasn't good, but it was actually just quality, quality bowling and fielding for both teams really, particularly our guys. Yeah, a lot of people probably don't realise, especially watching high and full member cricket a lot where the wicket's pristine, the outfields are pristine. You know, once yeah. you get to that level below, it's so so much more difficult to, to get things right, especially on, on the batting side of things and you see the lower scores and it's not necessarily an indication of, of less talent per se. It's just more about the conditions that they're playing in. But one team that, you know, in your area is mm-hmm. Papua New Guinea in the East Asia Pacific region and they're competing in World Cricket League 2, which is the tier above. Um, are they sort of the yardstick that you guys are trying to strive to reach eventually because that looks like the next goal for you guys? Yeah, 100%. We always use them as, a, as I say, the yardstick that we measure against and measure players. Would you get in the PNG team? If we've got lots of guys who have made the Papua New Guinea team, we're going, we're going the right way and moving forward. And it's so good to see them in the World Cup. Hopefully it goes ahead. They really deserve it. They've probably missed a couple of opportunities Previous years, they've been in the World Cup, which was a shame. But it's so good that they're in there. And, 
Yeah, we've we've never beaten them. I don't think in any uh, competitive competitive game besides the Pacific Games. That was it an ICC sanctioned event. I don't think, but um, yeah, they're yeah, see, and they they they've played a lot of four day cricket, which really helps development of cricket sometimes. And you know they've been together. They've got a strong side. Joe Dawes, a really good coach, got them firing at the moment. So it's great to see them and their women's too have been dominant in our region for a long period of time, and that's. For us, it's good to have someone who's playing at that level in our region because it makes us want to lift our game and, and try to get to that level, which is really good for the for cricket in general. So it's great they definitely fly the flag for for the East Asian Pacific and Japan who got in the World Cup last year for under yeah. nine. That was great to see, and that gives us hope for Vanuatu. You now we want to try to get in the World Cup, and there's no reason why we can't in uh, all our. All our teams, men's, women's, and under 19. So that's definitely the goal. But it's great to see PNG doing so well. And so they're definitely the yardstick, and we're trying to catch them and chase them. And hopefully, we can play in the World Cup with them one day. Yeah, that, that's yeah. the ultimate goal um, to see a lot of these emerging nations around the world competing at the highest level. And East Asia Pacific does look to be a, a higher potential uh, growth area of, uh, of the world. So before I let you go, um, Shane. And I'm sure there are a lot of people around the world who have potentially only followed Vanuatu cricket for, for a few weeks now. Um, for everyone around the world, you know, checking in, tuning in to, to Vanuatu cricket, I know you guys have been on a bit of a, a drive trying to, to garner some followers and some more attention around social media. What can people around the world do to contribute to Vanuatu cricket? Yeah, just follow us on social media in particular. Um Vote for us in the best shirt competition <laughs> that you've got. We've got to win that. I'm really, really keen. See that we love our shirts here, and it really encapsulates the Vanuatu people. But we want to play good cricket. We want to offer good cricket. So everyone, just get on our social medias and follow us. Whenever we play around the world in Malaysia, that's where hopefully will be the next uh, tournament. Come say hello. Come to the grounds. Visit us. Meet the guys. We're all open to it. For our friends in Australia, New Zealand in particular. We really want to, teams to come over and tour. They'll get a great experience. We can take them to Melee Village and play some village cricket, um, beach cricket. You can hang out at schools and go to the school programs. And uh, everyone who's done that uh, and teams have come over and done it, they've absolutely loved the experience. And the Holiday Inn, our sponsor, is one is the best resort in Vanuatu, right near the ground. You won't have a bad time. So. New Zealand and Australian teams get over here. We'll challenge first-class teams, academies. I think we'll beat them all at short format. And the Barmy Army, when you're coming out to the Ashes next, bring a team over to Vanuatu. We'll give you a huge game of cricket. And I'm sure the boys will show you how to drink a few Tuskers as well. <laughs> Best beer in the world. Definitely. So that's what we like to do. Yeah. And whenever we're overseas, please come watch us and say good day. And, you know, I'm not playing anymore, so I'll definitely have a beer with people after the games and say good day. And I'll, I'll, oh, we're going to put our shirts online too to sell. So I know Jim is <laughs> yeah. um, after my shirt daily. I'll get Jim. I'm going to get you on, mate. Relax. Just chill out. <laughs> I'm um, sorry. Yeah, watching. Oh, yeah, of course he is. He's legend. He's a Redback fan. So now, We'll, we'll get them online and pe people can start buying our merchandise when we get all that ready to go and the borders open up. Uh, that would be fantastic too. Yeah, well, I can also vouch for Tusker being a great drop and I will also <laughs> be purchasing one of those Vanuatu kits. But, yeah, especially for, for Australian and New Zealanders, I'm sure that travel will actually make it quite possible to, to travel to Vanuatu in the near future. Um, yeah. Touch wood on that. But, yeah, we're really keen to see how you guys develop in in the emerging yeah. cricket world as well as the uh, East Asia Pacific region because, you know, being quite close to you guys, we, we see a lot of that that growth almost, you know, right next to us as neighbours. So yeah, keep going with um, what you guys are doing. You're doing a great job. Everyone's really enjoying the stream. Thanks, um, Daniel. So, yeah, th thanks a lot for joining us here on the Emerging Cricket live show and, and hopefully we can uh, hear from you in the near future talking about some more success. Mate, thank you for having us and thank you for all the support you do for Associate Cricket. It, like this, these podcasts you do and all the things you do on social media makes a huge difference for, for us and the guys read all your articles and players. They absolutely love it. So you, you do make a big difference. So behalf of all the associates, thank you guys for, for bringing that coverage around the world and promoting all of us. And it makes a big difference. So great job for 
the emerging cricket and uh, keep uh, working hard for us, please. We, we really appreciate it. You know, we've got some more stuff coming up over the next couple of weeks with not only the uh, the wraps, but also some player profiles as well. So that's probably a good way to, to finish up tonight. Yeah. So once again, thanks, Shane, for joining us. And for everyone out there uh, watching the Emerging Cricket Live show, we've also got our podcast dropping tomorrow. As I said, we're talking to German cricket CEO Brian Mantle in part two of our chat. Uh, but for now, on behalf of myself, Daniel Beswick, and the entire Emerging Cricket team, as well as Shane Dietz, the CEO of Cricket Vanuatu. Thanks for joining us and goodbye. Well done. Thank you.